review sheet in particular that you want me to answer first? Because I want to address your questions if you have them before I get into other stuff. Just to make sure I hit on everything that you need. Um, if you need any paper at any point, I have extra paper up front. Feel free to help yourself. Um, so I'm going to go over the reference table pages that you're going to use first because the more you know off the reference table, the easier the test will be for you because a lot of your answers will be in there and it'll just make your life a bunch easier. Um, I'm going to use just a regular copy of the reference table, not one that's marked up because yours, you're going to get a brand new reference table, like never been used before. Wednesday in the afternoon. Those exams start at 11.30, um, so you don't need to come in in the morning unless you have another exam, okay? So um, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to stop me. Um, I will do some of the practice questions on half-lives because I know that is difficult for a lot of people. So we'll, spend, we'll come back to the half-lives. Um, but just as a quick reminder, carbon-14 is for anything organic, relatively recent, like within the, the, like the last 50,000 years. Um, and then what this tells you is what the carbon-14 turns into and how long it takes for half of it to stabilize, right? Um, you'd want to use uranium or rubidium for something that has, like, is older, okay? And again, we'll come back. I'll, I'll pick some questions off the test to go over this a little bit better, okay? But just remember that's there. Don't need to worry about specific heat for the midterm. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, for equations, we've used all of these except eccentricity, so gradient, that was on your um, lab exam. Change in elevation, which you get off the contour elevation lines, divided by the change in distance between. It just basically tells you how steep the area is. It's rise over run. Rate of change is very similar, except instead of dividing by distance, you're dividing by time, so it's going to give you speed. And then um, there is, like one of the first things on the review sheet talks about finding density. Density is mass divided by volume. Um, there are only two things that will change the density of a substance, and that would be pressure is one. Good, right? I squeeze something, it gets more dense because I'm squeezing it into a smaller space, and heat. Good call. Yep. So temperature and pressure are the only two things that change density. Nothing at all ever changes the half-life. Just the composition. You know, it depends on what's inside of it. If it's uranium or rubidium, that would change the half-life. But temperature, pressure, size, nothing affects the half-life. Size and shape doesn't matter for density, but temperature and pressure does matter. Because if I'm squeezing it, it becomes more dense. If I'm heating it up, it expands and becomes less dense. Uh, on the reference table, it has a density of water at its densest, which is around 4 degrees Celsius, is 1 gram per milliliter. Remember, we use water as a standard. If you drop something in water, it flows, it's less dense. If you drop something in water, it sinks, it's more dense. All right, but um, that's the equation for it. Up, uh, on the bottom, this was another thing on the review sheet. This was um, under the intro. So in the intro, it says be able to find density. That's the reference table, page one. Um, and then being able to find the elements is also on page one, which I marked here. at the bottom. Okay. Um, so it says you use ESRT page one to find the element that makes up the greatest percentage of Earth's crust. So be careful because they do have different things. They have it by mass and by percentage, but it comes out to be the same. Earth's crust by far has the most oxygen and then silicon. So, um, maybe oxygen. If that's something you just memorize, fine, but it's something that you don't have to memorize because it's on the front page. Okay, so um, the other things that are on here, so they have the elements, they have the element symbol, because sometimes that's helpful, like when we're looking at potassium up in the half-lives, it just notes it with like the K sometimes. It's okay, and so that matches. Um, so crust. Hydrosphere is the water sphere, so like 
the oceans are mostly oxygen and hydrogen. And then the troposphere is the atmosphere. You don't have to worry about that right now. But troposphere is like the air, right? And that's mostly nitrogen. And then second is oxygen. Any questions on the front page? Okay. So I'm going to turn to the next two pages. We just started talking about these in class. Um, the questions on here aren't too hard, but I'm going to sort of pre-teach it for you. So that we'll be doing this tomorrow or Friday, depending on which class you're in. It's not too hard, though. Um, so these are landscapes, and landscapes are defined by um, elevation and what the bedrock is like. So... I will show you what mine looks like on here. So, um, and we'll be labeling this in class, so if you don't wanna do that now, you don't have to. Um, but if you wanna write this, if you have it out, great. But again, you don't have to. Um, so we have the Appalachian Plateau. The Appalachian Plateau is everything within what I highlighted in pink. The Appalachian Plateau includes the Allegheny Plateau, the Tug Hill Plateau, which if you're in a snowmobiling, you've heard of that because that gets a lot of snow. Um, and the Catskills, the mountains, are actually not mountains, they're a plateau. A plateau is just something with high elevation and horizontal bedrock. So you know how rocks are deposited in flat horizontal layers? That's how the plateau forms. Um, flat horizontal layers and they get pushed up to a high level. Um, plains have a low elevation and a horizontal bedrock. So like near your large bodies of water, like the Erie, Ontario by the Great Lakes, um, and then the coastal area also, low lying. And then mountains, the only true mountains in New York um, are the Adirondack Mountains. So the Adirondack Mountains are um, high elevation, but the bedrock is distorted. So that's just how they're broken down. So your plains and plateaus are usually mostly sedimentary because that's just like the deposition, like sedimentary rocks. Mountains are usually formed by volcanoes or colliding plates. Okay. So uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on, in class um, tomorrow and Friday on this. But the main questions on the midterm off of this page just have to do with matching um, different bedrock to different landscapes. I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Okay, so if I look on the next page, right below it, we started talking about this in classes today. This is the latitude and longitude map, but it also has the rock types um, in New York. And we'll be um, filling this out, writing this in, in classes as well. So you have the geologic periods and eras in New York here. So as I go down, Cretaceous, if you look in pages um, eight and nine, that double page, Cretaceous is the most recent. And then as I go down, it gets longer ago. Middle Proterozoic was like end of Precambrian. Okay. So most recent, as I go down through these codes, they get older. So most of your New York State bedrock, meaning the solid rock, is sedimentary rock that formed during the Devonian period. All right, so the dots are right here. So that matches with the Devonian. And it tells me that the Devonian rocks are mostly limestone, shale, sandstones, and conglomerates. So if you've ever hiked in the Catskills, which are right over here, those are the kinds of rocks that you'd find in that plateau. Um, and you can match, like, the Catskills up here match right here. So that's like one of the, the questions they like ask about that, so being able to match them up. Or like the Adirondack Mountains are up here. I know it's kind of gray, but this is the Adirondack Mountains. So that would match up with this. So I call it swirls and sprinkles. So if I go to the bottom, the swirls and the sprinkles are middle Proterozoic. And it tells me that it's mostly intensely metamorphosed rocks. So that means you're gonna find mostly metamorphic rocks there from when like the plates collided and created the mountains there. And it says specifically gneisses, quartzites, and marbles. Okay, so the symbol tells you what time period it's from. You can use pages eight and nine for the actual age um, and to find fossils, etc. cetera. Um, then it tells you in the wording next to it what kinds of rocks you would find. It's 
specifically like limestones and shales or sandstones and dolostones. And then at the end, it tells you if it's mostly sedimentary. So dominantly sedimentary origin means mainly sedimentary from where it comes from, origins where it comes from. D dominantly metamorphosed and intensely metamorphosed, meaning like colliding plates. Any questions on those two pages? There are some questions with latitude and longitude, and we're going to continue practice with that um, at the end of this week. But just remember, lat is flat, so those are the ones that go side to side, and it goes north and south of the equator. Always north for anywhere in the uh, United States. And up and down is longitude, which west in the United States. Okay. Cool. Um, we didn't talk about surface currents yet, so this isn't something you have to know for the midterm. Just remember, though, that there are latitudes and longitudes on this map, as well as on tectonic plate maps, which we did use. So this is uh, page five of the reference table, so that's a good one to know. And this is a good way to quickly review as well. Uh, there are, there's a question off the test that asks about... Yeah, I can actually find it really quick. Um, on which tectonic, tectonic plate is Puerto Rico located? Um, so they're going to give you a map that shows where Puerto Rico is. And then you'll just have to match it up. Puerto Rico is over here. So it's on the Caribbean plate, right? Um, and if they needed the latitude and longitude of that, then you just go um, to the side. So let me scooch it over so we can see that. So you always want to do latitude first. Always. So I have the Caribbean plate. So if I go over to the side, it's like, I don't know, 12 degrees north because we're north of the equator. And then if I want the longitude, I drop down and it'd be like 75 degrees west because we're west of the prime meridian. Make sure you use that reference point. Okay, so they'll use this map um, for a couple of questions on the test, either to find what plate a location is located on, or to give the latitude and longitude of one of the boundaries, or they'll give you the latitude and longitude of one of the boundaries um, and ask what plate is located there, what kind of fault line. So um, our fault types are transform faults. Those are the ones that fly past one another. So like California, over in the sandwich plate area, the transform faults. So they just fly past. Um, divergent, mostly in the middle oceans because they're splitting apart and then that fills in with water. So divergent are usually in the middle of your oceans. And then convergent are where two plates come together. The more dense one sinks. When it sinks, it melts and it creates volcanoes on what's called the overriding plate, the one that doesn't sink. The one with the rectangles on it is the overriding plate. So like your volcanoes are on the west coast of North America because the Juan de Fuca plate is sinking underneath it. And it sinks because it's more dense. Oceanic crust is more dense because it's colder and it's more compact. Yeah. And what it's made up of. All right. Um, right. So it's usually your convergent boundary type. Convergent boundaries that create your tsunamis. Right. Two plates collide and that friction really builds up and then that release of the pressure sends energy out in all directions. Um, and there is a question on tsunamis um, and timing of tsunamis on the short answer part of the test doing the time for that. So if we have time, I'll, give it, I'll show you what that looks like. And then of course, don't forget your hotspots, any of those ones with the little firecracker looking things like Hawaii and St. Helena and the Canary Islands and Iceland. Um, hotspots are volcanic activity away from plate boundaries. And in that case, the hotspot stays and the plates move. So like the... Um, Pacific plate is moving in the direction of these arrows, so kind of north, northwest. So it's dragging the islands away from the active hotspot um, and creates a chain of islands. Actually, if you were to see the bottom of the ocean, you'd see a whole chain of islands that go up here to the Aleutian Trench where they get sucked under um, this plate and get melted is kind of recycling the crust there. Um, but you can see a whole chain of islands stretching from Hawaii. So the volcano stays put and the islands get moved away. Okay. Oh boy. Lots off of these two pages. This is um, for rocks on pages six and seven. Um, and this is mentioned in your review sheet as well. 
Um, so six and seven go with page 16, which are your minerals. So they kind of group together. Um, so rock cycle up here. Just remember that the rectangles are your rock types, sedimentary, metamorphic, igneous. The bubbles are like the ingredients. So magma solidifies to make igneous rock. Igneous rock goes through weathering and erosion, which is just breaking down to make sediments. Sediments are deposited, compacted, cemented, sedimentary rock, right? And you can just go around to follow the arrows. Or if you're like, how do you get igneous rock? You go to igneous rock and you just go backwards. The solidification of magma, which comes from the melting of other things. Um, we haven't really dealt with stream flow yet. We'll do that after midterms, so you don't need to worry about that. But what this does do is it breaks down the sediment size, which comes into what kind of sedimentary rocks form. So you can get it off of here or the page next door to it. You'll get the uh, size range. They match. All right. Igneous rocks. Igneous rocks um, form from the cooling and solidification of magma. If it's extrusive, it cools quickly on the surface. So the one that always comes up is obsidian. Um, scoria is similar, except it's made of darker stuff and it has air pockets in it. So if you go to the side with the texture, if it says vesicular, that just means it has air pockets. Remember that the texture is based on the crystal size. So a fine texture um, means small crystals and a coarse texture means big crystals. That's important. If it has big crystals, it's intrusive. It means that it was like insulated inside the ground, which means it has longer to cool, so the minerals are able to form and develop more clearly. So inside is all of your rock types, and when you drop down, it tells you a lot about them. So for example, rhyolite is extrusive, so it forms on the surface, and it has a fine texture, so small crystals. And if I go down, it tells me that rhyolite is gonna be light in color, low in density, and felsic in composition because is made up of all the stuff directly underneath it. So amphibole, biotite, plagioclase, quartz, and potassium felspar. Light colored minerals make light colored rocks. Makes sense, except for the obsidian which cools so fast that you don't really get the clear mineral formation. Um, on the other side, let's take another one. So gabbro, for example, is intrusive, so it cools slowly inside the earth. Um, it's coarse in size for texture, meaning it has large grain size. Non-vesicular, all intrusive rocks are non-vesicular. Right? The only chance that you have of air pockets is with an extrusive rock. So gabbro is dark in color, higher in density, and mafic in composition because it's made out of these minerals, plagioclase, pyroxene, olivine, amphibole, and biotite, so mostly darker minerals. And then the ones in the middle just are sort of a mix between the two. So diorite, andesite, and vesicular andesite are what they call intermediate, which means in the middle, so kind of a balance between mafic and felsic. Your more explosive volcanoes are felsic. They don't ask about that, but these are your more explosive ones. And then the mafic are usually the ones that you find in the ocean, which they do ask about. So oceanic crust is mostly mafic because it's basaltic rock. And the crust is mostly granitic, so that's like felsic and less dense. Um, other rocks, sedimentary, burial and compaction of fragments. The differences in the top parts is just like what they call classic is like the size of the stuff inside of it. And then they have the special notes. The chemical and bioplastic just means like uh, if the water evaporates and leaves it behind, it crystallizes. Or remember, coal forms from plant remains. So you have a warm swamp, things decompose. Um, they turn into stuff called peat. Peat gets compressed and compacted and forms the coal. Um, remember that sedimentary rocks are the only rocks that can have fossils in them. And then metamorphic, heat and pressure. Foliated means mineral alignment, and the minerals line up by density. So the more intense the heat and pressure, the more lined up. So nice will be um, banded very clearly. Um, but slate, phyllite, and schist all show signs of lining up. Remember with metamorphic rocks that, and this is going to come into play, this is an important part of it. One of the things on the review sheet says, find the name of the metamorphic rock given um, the sedimentary rock. So for example, if I have a geologic history sequence and I have an intrusion and they ask me what kind of rock is formed and they show me the symbol for slate, I mean for shale, sorry, shale, Sh um, shale will make slate. So remember the comments tells you the sedimentary rock that forms the metamorphic rock. 
Um, if they show you um, sandstone, then sandstone makes quartzite. So, make that a little clearer. Let me show you what I mean. So this is off the test. All right, so this is part of the short answer part of the test. Okay, so um, they have the intrusion here. Okay, so this is an igneous rock cutting through sedimentary rocks. Um, bricks is limestone, dashes are shale, um, dots, sandstone. All right, so at the boundaries, then I could look up the types that would be involved. So with the bricks, with limestone, well, when I find limestone, that matches up with marble. So at the boundary between the symbol with the bricks and right here where those dashes are, I'd find marble. Shale makes slate, sandstone makes quartzite. Okay. And when in doubt, Hornfells. Hornfells is kind of a, a nice go to answer because it comes from anything. So contact morph metamorphism can always form Hornfells. That's always an option. That's a nice trick to remember if you forget about the reference table thing. So when in doubt, Hornfells, because it comes from various minerals. Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on the geologic history two pages, but there is a lot of stuff off of here. Key thing, remember, 88% of time was Precambrian. So even though it looks small on the graph, it's a large, large percentage of geologic time. So on a pie chart, it'd be significantly bigger. Um, and then it zooms in. So remember, the gray goes down and around. And then you go from the bottom up, and this is in millions of years. Um, never cross a solid line, so everything on this side stays on this side, everything on this side stays in there. So um, the Phanerozoic, which is the one we're currently in, is broken down into Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras, mostly based on mass extinctions. Um, so mass extinctions usually end the era, and then um, the rest of the periods are broken down based on changes in life. Uh, be careful with where they say earliest, because that means when they first came into play. Abundant means there was a bunch of them, and then mass extinction means they leave, or they're gone. Um, and you can match that also with these lifelines. I call them lifelines. So this is where the graptolites came into existence, and then where the line ends is when they went extinct. Okay, so dinosaurs, when they came into existence, so that matches, earliest dinosaurs matches with that line. And then where they went extinct, that matches. Any line that goes to the top means they're still around today. But 99% of anything that's ever existed is now extinct. All right. This is just representing, again, this is geologic history of New York State. So specific to New York State. Um, rock record is here. So if they ask about missing rock record, this is where you'd look. Usually the one they ask about is the Permian. Yeah, Permian. Geologic events would be things like the advance and retreat of the last ice age, um, intrusion of the Palisades sill, opening of the Atlantic Ocean, any mountain formations. Orogeny just means mountain formations. And then on the far side, you just have North America moving over time. So we used to be more on the equator, and then we moved up and out over time. So it's gotten colder or less tropical. Um, page 10 is Earth's interior. So just remember, this is a quarter of the Earth from crust to core. Um, it has on the side here the granitic continental crust. Density is 2.7. Basaltic oceanic crust is 3.0. Remember the granite and the basalt from the igneous rock table. Um, then you have the asthenosphere where convection takes place. Now this is really important. This is on the test and people mess this question up a bunch. So let me actually um, write this on the side. So this is going to be off the test. Just because this is one that's typically missed. All right. At a mid ocean ridge, your convection currents look like this. So there'd be like a little break here in your plates. So your plates are going to be doing whatever is going on underneath it. So my convection's going up and out. My plates are going up and out. This would be a mid-ocean ridge. That's the one that we typically talk about, but the test is going to ask about a trench. So let me actually find that diagram so I can draw it most accurately. 
trenches are a little bit different because a trench is where a plate is sinking. So it's gonna sink in. So the question that's on the test, and I'll star it so you remember that this is the one that you need to know. Convection is important for sure, but the diagram that you need to know is going to look like they're gonna have the crust. You're gonna have this dotted line to represent like the asthenosphere. They're gonna sort of have this piece going in and that's gonna be labeled trench. Okay, so just like when you think about trenches, like when they talk about like World War II and history, same idea. So it's going in, into the ground. Um, so your arrows would be going, it'd be sinking instead. So it's the other side of this convection current, right? So if I were to continue on with this, it'd be sinking. Um, and you can see that, so the arrows are pointing towards the middle, so it's pulling this crust in. All right, you can see that convection current on the reference table too, it's right here and it's labeled with trench, so, but it's on the side and people often forget it's there. We can see like the arrows are coming together. All right, so that's the same idea. All right, um, mantle is the biggest portion of it. Then you have the outer core, which is liquid iron and nickel. Um, so it sloshes around, creates a magnetic field. We know it's liquid iron and nickel because of the way like the waves interact there. Um, the density changes cause the waves to bend. Protects us from like getting blasted with the radiation. So that's important in the magnetic field. And that's because of this metal on the inside. And then the inner core is solid iron and nickel. And it's solid because even though it's hotter, there's more pressure and it forces it into a solid. Um, so the inner core is solid, the outer core is liquid. And we know what's inside the earth by studying earthquake waves that, or seismic waves, that one comes up a lot. So then um, just for a quick example, if they ask uh, anything about like the boundary between the mantle and outer core, I can get an idea of the density, It'd be somewhere between those ranges. And then if I go down, it would tell me that the temperature, or the pressure, sorry, the pressure, if I get to that solid line, I go to the left, would be like 1.2 million atmospheres. And the temperature would be like 5,000 degrees Celsius. And it's below the melting point, so that means it would be in the solid state. Then I can go all the way to the bottom, and it tells me how far down that is, so 3,000 kilometers. P waves and S waves, I'm gonna do some practice questions off of that too, just like the half-lives, because those are the ones that people tend to have a hard time with. Just remember that it goes by 200 across the bottom and 20 seconds up the side. P waves travel twice as fast as S waves. P waves go through everything, S waves only through solids. Um, the only other page we've covered so far this year is page 16 on the back. So that would be your minerals on the back. So don't forget that's back there. Um, okay. So um, you'll see like from like the igneous rock that like potassium feldspar is in a bunch of those rocks. So potassium feldspar is towards the bottom. So I can figure out from there that it has a hardness of six, which means it was scratched glass is considered hard. Uh, it's checked off for cleavage, it's white to pink in color. It tells me special things about it, like that it cleaves in two directions at 90 degrees. It's used for ceramic glass. And composition's what it's made up of. Um, so the symbols are here, but remember at the bottom, it tells you what those symbols mean. I think there's some short answer questions on that. So, um, I am going to go over some questions off the actual test, okay? Um, if you need to go, remember I'm uploading um, and this onto my YouTube page. It'll be about the end of the week, so you can review it. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the test, and um, just from getting this for numerous years, I sort of know where students get stuck. So uh, that is sort of where I'll put my attention, uh, just to um, sort of focus where we're going with things. 
Uh, if at any time you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, okay, so I'm just going to kind of put some key ideas off the test of questions that might be helpful. So um, to answer question number one, um, so I'm just going to sort of bullet point. So if percentage of felsic minerals increases, so felsic, I just did mins, minerals increases, up arrow, uh, rock color is going to be lighter, and density will, let me just verify off the reference table, I believe it also gets lower. Also be lower. Question number one, that's your answer. So as a rock becomes more felsic, it's going to get lighter in color and lower in density. That's gonna be, uh, I'll put just, you don't have to write it if you don't want to, but it's right on the reference table, ESRT page six. So um, remember down here is my sliding scale. So composition, as I go more and more towards the felsic side, I'm gonna get lower in density and lighter in color. Okay, so that's the answer for question one. I just kind of phrased it a little differently. Um, for question number two, uh, it's asking about geologic history. That's cool. And one of the biggest, more, most important things that happened in our geologic history uh, happened about 2.2 billion years ago. which in your reference table, you can find it under, um, they'll have it as 2,200 million years ago. That means the same thing. But in the reference table, they go by millions of years. Um, the oceanic oxygen. enters the atmosphere. Okay, so that's question two. And that's the reference table. You can find it if you um, aren't good at memorizing information. ESRT page eight has that. So 2.2 billion years ago is right here. And if I go over to the right, it says oceanic oxygen begins to enter the atmosphere. Oh, that's important because that's what allowed life to diversify here. Oh boy, P wave and S wave. I'm gonna do an example question. What is the approximate time difference? between P and S waves at a station. And I'm not gonna use the exact number off the test, but I'm gonna use something like similar. So you have an example, um, 6,000 kilometers away.
Okay, so there's a couple ways that you can do this. Um, usually, especially on a test when I'm like, can, you know, just distracted by just the test environment. Um, gravity's really strong over here today. Um, I don't necessarily want to do the math, but you can do the math and I'll show you how to do that too. But if you need to find the approximate time difference between P and S waves at a station uh, 6,000 kilometers away, it says to go to ESRT page 11, you go to the distance and use your scrap paper. Okay, so this is 6,000 kilometers away. I'm gonna use my scrap paper, I'm gonna line it up. Okay, I'm gonna make a mark where the S wave marks my paper, S wave, and where my P wave. Right. For the sake of showing you the other way, I'm gonna write down that my S wave would come in at 17 minutes and my P wave would have been around 9.30. Okay, and then it says to shift down to the left-hand side and it will tell you the difference is about, well, that's seven, that's 7.20, 7.40, so the difference is about seven minutes and 30 seconds. Okay. If I subtract, then I should get the same thing. So if I do 17 minutes, divided by, or sorry, subtract 9 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, give me 7 minutes and 30 seconds. So you get the same answer either way. So you can either subtract S wave minus P wave travel times, or you can just shift down. You don't have to do any subtraction. You get the same either way. So the answer for that one, if you just want to recreate it, um, is seven minutes. This is the way they phrase it in the answer, although it's going to be a different answer because it's a different distance. But they'll do um, minutes, and then they'll do the seconds. Um, I'm going to skip some of these that we've talked about already. Okay, again, I mentioned this when we went over the reference table, but I'll um, go over it with the question part. Um, ask about uh, texture of igneous rock formed deep underground would be coarse. Right. It's not feel, it's size, so bigger crystals. All right. Remember that sedimentary rocks form. Form in horizontal layers. And they might get like tilted and shifted afterwards. But um, with a question like this, you have the symbols here. So you use the reference table, page seven. And you just look for the sedimentary rocks with the symbols that match it. So, um, like this is shale, sandstone, conglomerate. So anything with a symbol that matches my sedimentary rock types, so anything up here, would be flat horizontal layers. Um, anything that's like an intrusion, like C and D, are out. So anything with the answer like C and D in there is out. Any of these sedimentary rock layers, though, would have been flat and horizontal to begin with, and then something came around and shifted them. Okay, and we already talked about that trench one, so that's that. Oh. Okay. Oh, here's a half life one. So, um, so the question is how old is a human bone with 12.5% carbon-14. Okay. 
So I always do like a sh small chart to keep track of that. So they just need to know the um, age. So I might have to do an extra. So I'm gonna do a percent and I'm gonna do an age. So um, when the bone was first in existence after the death, the carbon-14 begins to stabilize. Um, so at that time, it's 100% carbon-14. The bone is new. So. All right. After one half-life, 50%. Carbon-14, the other 50% has changed to stable nitrogen-14. And based on the reference table, page one, it'd be 5,700 years old. So use ESRT page one. And whatever element they gave you, which in this case was carbon. So that's where I got the 5,700 from, was from the front page. Okay, uh, next would be 25%. And I'm just gonna take the 5,700 and add it to itself to get this number, because another half-life's gone by, which is the same amount of time. Or you could take the 5,700 and multiply it by two, because we've been through two half-lives. All right, we're not to the 12.5% yet, so I need to do one more. So to get the 12.5%, um, I am just going to take 11,400 and I'm going to add 5,700 to it. Um, I would highly suggest bringing a basic calculator with you um, for questions like this. I only have 20 calculators for 75 students um, and I'm not going to be necessarily in your room. So bring a basic calculator. It can be, um, it can't be a graphing calculator, but like the scientific calculator is fine or a far function calculator. Um, and we will have some calculators, but don't count on those because we have limited amount. Or you could just do the math on, in your head. That's fine. But 17,100 would be the answer for that. Okay. Um, okay. This is, kind, this is new, and we're going to talk about it in class at the end of this week, but this is new, so let me talk about it now. So, um, Polaris is a fancy word for the North Star. The angle, angle, between the horizon and Polaris equals your latitude. Only works north of the equator though, because the Earth is kind of round and it blocks out the North Star from the Southern Hemisphere. So it's only in the Northern Hemisphere. So, um, as latitude, latitude increases, Polaris, Appears higher in the sky. So like at the North Pole, the North Star would be directly over your head. At the equator, the North Star would be right on the horizon. The horizon's where the sky meets the ground. So here, um, you have the observer. Here I am. Um, and straight out is the horizon. And the North Star is like up here. I kind of ran out of space, but I put a little star there. And let's say that that angle is 30 degrees. Then my latitude equals 30 degrees. And it's always north, always, because it's the North Star and you can only see it in the Northern Hemisphere. So there's a few questions on that and we're gonna cover that first thing in class tomorrow. So it's a pretty simple concept. Um, put a couple questions on it. And they always try to throw you with having to do some kind of math and you don't. 
north angle between the horizon, which is straight out, and the north stars equals here latitude in degrees north. There are some questions that keep coming up, like why does obsidian have the glassy texture that it does? That's been on a lot of your break reviews. Um, okay. Same with the ocean crust thing. So I'm just gonna do a couple more questions off this, and then I'm gonna jump to the short answer because this has been off the multiple choice. Um, and this goes about halfway through the multiple choice, but some of the ideas are sort of like redundant. So mid-ocean ridges. The oceanic crest is dark colored igneous. Dark colored igneous because uh, it's basalt, which is a mafic igneous rock. So um, it'll be dark in color. Okay. Um, again, bunch of questions that repeat off of past test and break packets. Um, I'm just scanning through to get the most bang for our buck here. Um, Earth layers. Formed due to gravitational pull and density. So everything sorts out by density and it's that effect of gravity trying to pull everything towards the center that pulls the most dense stuff farthest in, less dense stuff on the outside. Um, question asked about which mineral will, will scratch um, other minerals. Remember, harder minerals scratch softer ones. So you can get the hardness off of page 16 of the reference table. Um, you want to use carbon-14 for anything with, like, bones from the recent past, like the Holocene epoch, for example. You want to use carbon-14. Um, remember that... Um, Contour lines slash profiles will not have points the same distance apart. So that's an error because um, the land isn't equally distributed either, right? So contour lines and profiles are based on what's going on with the ground, so it's not going to be equally spaced between your points. Um, it'll be dependent on the surface features. Um, let me do another P wave, S wave one. So... Um, I'm gonna use a similar example. I'm gonna read off the test and I'm just gonna change the numbers slightly. Earthquake, I'm just gonna do EQ, occurs at 12.08 p.m. S wave arrives at 12.25 p.m. When did the P wave arrive? How far away was the station? Okay, so this one's a little bit more complex. I think this was one of the questions on the break packets actually. So you'll see it there as well. 
So the first thing I need to do is figure out the travel time for my S wave. And so to do that, I'm going to subtract. So step one, I'm going to take 12, 25, and subtract 1208, which gives me a difference of 17 minutes. Okay, step two. Go to page 11, find um, travel time on left, go to S wave line, drop down to P wave line and then go left and then you go go straight down for distance so i'm gonna show you what that looks like this is just a reminder for when you're reviewing okay so step one since they're giving me clock time i'm subtracting when the s wave arrives from when the earthquake started because that'll tell me how long after the earthquake it took for the s wave to get to me and so that's where i get the 17 minutes from so then i go to page 11 i find 17 minutes i go till i get to my s wave line i drop down to my p wave line and i go to the left and it tells me that the p wave travel time was like nine minutes and 25 seconds so um so with that information, what I would have to do is you take the earthquake origin time, which was 1208, and you're going to add the P wave travel time, which was what I said, 925. So remember that this is hours, minutes, seconds. So if I'm doing 9 minutes and 25 seconds, I just need to keep, keep it in the right spot. So that means that my P wave arrived. So this is the earthquake start. Okay. So my earthquake would have started, at, or sorry, my P wave would have come in at 10. So I just add them together. And then if I drop straight down, I can stay right in that zone. So I go to the 17 minutes, I hit this, I go down, I go to the left. That's how I got my time to add to the earthquake start time to know when my P wave got in. If I go straight down, it would tell me my distance is 6,000 6, kilometers away. All right, and that's where this came from. Okay, so it's a two-parter. Um, if you get one of the parts, it'll narrow it down to you, for you. Um, so you can pretty much find it that way. Um, and there's quite a few questions on the P-Wave and S-Wave chart. I know it's not a favorite, so you might want to look up some videos if you have a hard time with a chart. They um, have plenty of websites that go over how to use it. Um, topography, I know we just have a couple of minutes left. They're going to have a highest possible elevation or um, a possibility, a possible elevation of A, so possible elevation. Um, so let's say I just have some circles in here. And if this is 0, 50, 100, A, you can pick any number um, between 101 and 149. I would just pick halfway because you're gonna have to pick one. So possible for A would be 125. Um, highest for A would be the 149. One less than what the next line would be. Remember for your water, that water flows out of the bees. 
So there's going to be a question about um, the direction that Flint Creek will flow. And the contour lines will look something like this. You can use Pathman to figure out what direction. And in this case, it would be northeast. Right. And then the last question on that section um, is gradient. Gradient, and then I'll show you that really quick, and then I'll do the last question on the multiple choice. Um, with the short answer, again, you'll have mostly profiles, and um, like there's some reading and some um, like ESRT questions. So the short answer can be kind of complicated, but it tests on the same kind of concepts in the short uh, you get in the multiple choice. So remember, with gradient, you just do change in elevation. Gradient equals change in elevation. This will be on the short answer and the multiple choice. You get that, get from contour lines. And then you're going to divide by the change in the distance. And for that, you use, you use scrap and map scale. And then the last question on the multiple choice. So there's 50 multiple choice questions. Ask about um, increased CO2. Comes from increased use of fossil fuels. And that will cause our temperatures to continue to rise. So um, just to quickly kind of go over what you can expect with the short answer, since we don't have time to really go over the concept, um, it'll ask about the composition of Earth's core, which we talked about on page 10. It'll ask about two elements that you can find in um, minerals, so you use page 16 of the reference table for that. Estimated age of the Earth and solar system is in the reference table. There is a profile that goes underwater. Make sure you round out your hills and valleys. It'll ask you about approximate ages of things. Um, it'll explain that um, the age of the ocean floor gets older as you move away from the center. The new rock in the middle, older rock gets pushed out to the side. Um, there will be a question about a trail map that will ask about stream flow. Uh, it will ask about the contour interval, which is what each line is worth. Um, and it'll ask how long it'll take a person to hike from one place to another based on miles per hour. So if they're hiking like three miles per hour, you have to figure out how long a trail is. And then you can figure out um, how long it will take. So if they take, you know, um, if they're going on a six mile hike, it would take them two hours to complete it. There's going to be a question, and this was on like your past, like we've had a bunch of questions on tests on these. So it's like um, igneous rock versus metamorphic rock. It'll ask about the size of the crystals, and it'll ask about mafic and falsic and color and density. Um, we'll have another cross-section, like side view thing. There's going to be geologic history with like sequence of events that has some index fossils in there that you'll match up. It'll ask about grain size of some of the sedimentary rocks in there straight off the reference table. Um, Remember that with your intrusions, it follows a contact metamorphism. So if the rock has contact metamorphism, that means it was there before the intrusion. Remember that ash is a good time marker because it's a wide area, short period of time. Um, and then the last page is another gradient and profile thing. So they keep hitting on that stream flow direction. So you can use Pathman. Um, and then another sequence of events. Uh, more minerals thing and then the last one has to do with just it's going to be a map of a tsunami and you just use the map and it has like the waves going out in all directions and you can just use they label the thing on this question that people miss is that they label the hours on the lines and so they'll give you a location um, away from the epicenter and they'll ask how long did it take the tsunami to get there and you just use the lines around it to pick something in the range so if it was like between like two and a half hours and three hours you could just say like three hours and 45 minutes like that.
So just pay attention to the markings on here. It's a pretty easy question if you just remember to read the lines. And that's the end of the short answer. Any questions? So it's a lot, but again, a lot of it hits on the same stuff, and knowing the reference table, a lot of that stuff's in there. Okay, cool. Thanks for sticking it out.